Good morning. And happy Father's Day to those who are fathers. We're going to talk about fathers today. And uh, was ever a time in my lifetime, I guess, uh, where our culture needed godly fathers. It's, I guess, no time like the present. Um, Satan's done a masterful job uh, in ruining what God designed relative to the family, and the consequences of that are evident on several levels. And so, uh, thankfully, we look to the Word of God this morning and see what God has designed. And uh, in fact, even if you're not a father here today, there's things that uh, you, I think, will glean from this as the Word of God is indeed alive and powerful. And why don't we just uh, bow for a second in prayer before we dig in? Father, we are grateful uh, that we can look into the Word of God. Thank you for your design for the family. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, the challenges abound in our day and age. And, and your blueprint is often missed, and the consequences are everywhere. And I pray that we would recognize that uh, all Scripture, including Scripture regarding uh, parenting, is uh, been given to us uh, for our learning, for our understanding, and for our benefit. And I pray as we look into the Word of God today, the Spirit of God would illumine our thinking and impress us with who you are by grace, that we could just recognize that we are, we are only by the grace of God, and that uh, we need you every hour. And I pray for the fathers uh, of our church and fathers everywhere, that they would recognize the resources available in Christ, and they'd allow you to work in them and through them to become the fathers you'd have them to be for your glory. So we thank you for these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bible, you can open it to Ephesians chapter 4, or excuse me, 6. This morning, Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> Kind of give away my age here. I grew up listening to Paul Harvey on the radio, and I always enjoyed it. He was very insightful. His delivery was always uh, very good, kept you interested, and, and, uh, and oftentimes you'd walk away knowing the rest of the story. For those of you who have never heard him, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but I'm sure you know, what he has said in the past is available. It'd be worth a time to listen. But he did say one time of a five-year-old who was in the backyard brushing her dog's teeth, when her father asked her what she was doing, she replied, Don't worry, Daddy, I will put your toothbrush back like I always have. <laughs> Ooh, gives me the willies. I speak to you today as a... I've been a father for almost 31 years now. <clears throat> I can't believe my oldest is going to be 31 uh, this November. My son turned 29 here a few weeks ago. My middle daughter, uh, I think, is going to turn 28. Yeah, my... <laughs> My youngest, to me, is just a child, but she's going to be 24 in January. They all have spouses. It's just crazy. I, uh, I've got uh, a two-and-a-half-year-old grandchild, a one-and-a-half-year-old grandchild, a seventh-month-old grandchild, and how old is Joseph? Six weeks old, and I guess I've got one on the way, as the cat was let out of the bag this morning. Elizabeth is pregnant. And so, it's humbling. Oh, mercy. But you know, the family is something God designed, and the family, uh, is, he designed it to be the uh, building block, really, of society. And, uh, and I'm going to put something up here. We did a, a parenting study about five years ago here at the church, and I, I pulled this up. I think this was written in the late 70s. And so, uh, this is from the Houston Police Department, and this was and how to, uh, uh, how, to, how to wreck your child or something. Here it is. <clears throat> Begin with infancy to give the child everything he wants, and this way he will grow up believing the world owes him a living. When he picks up bad words, laugh at him. This will make him think he's cute. It will also encourage him to pick up gutter phrases that will blow the top of your head later. And again, go back 40-some years here. Um, never give him any spiritual training. Wait till he's 21 and then let him decide for himself. Avoid the use of the word wrong. It may develop a guilt complex. This will condition him to believe later when he's arrested for stealing a car that society is against him and he's being persecuted. Pick up everything he leaves lying around, books, shoes, toys, and clothes. Do everything for him so he will experience in throwing all the responsibility on others. Let him read any printed material he can get his hands on, and now we can certainly update that to 
uh, electronic material. Be careful that the silverware and the drinking glasses are sterilized, but let his mind feast on garbage. Quarrel frequently in his presence, and this way he will not be shocked when the home is broken up later. Give a child all the spending money he wants, never let him earn his own. Why should he have things as tough as you had them? Sounds like my dad coming out here. Uh, <laughs> satisfy his every craving for food, drink, and comfort. Denial may lead to harmful frustrations. Take his part against neighbors, teachers, policemen. They're all prejudiced against your child. And uh, that was pretty uh, apropos then, and it's equally apropos now. And then another one came up in the same era about how to raise a brat. So many today have been successful at raising brats. Here's some, f some of the finest advice you'll ever receive on how to raise a brat. When a baby, don't let him cry in bed. Do not allow your baby to suffer any hardships, especially in infancy. Run to his aid as soon as he cries. He'll soon know how to control you rather than you controlling him. This way, they'll expect to be pampered all their lives. Let him say, no, it's so cute. Let that be his favorite word. Sure, it's rebellion verbalized, but he should be allowed to have a mind of his own. Do not give any duties responsibilities. Do it all for them. Then they'll think this world owes them a living. They'll quickly join the crowd of grown-up babies shouting, I've got my rights, rather than those who are men and a woman enough to fulfill the responsibilities. Never spank them when the senior citizens today speak of spanking as being the way it used to be. Remember, grandma and grandpa were child abusers. Don't ever discipline your child. Wait till they're in trouble. Let the penal system, prisons and jails discipline them. Listen to Dr. Spock, who never raised a child in his life and the other child psychologists, not the old timers who raised five to 10 children successfully. Throw out the Bible and its admonitions like he that spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him chastens him. B times are early in life, Proverbs 13, 24. The rod and the reproof, that's teaching that exposes wrong. Give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame, Proverbs 29, 15. You can only develop a true brat if you won't properly discipline them. Defend them in school, always take the child's side. Teachers and principals have got it in or out for that little angel. Understand that your child can do no wrong. Expect teachers and principals to know that too. Criticize leaders and preachers, you can't trust them. Tear down authority in front of them, make sure they hear you. They'll live in insecurity not knowing who to trust. They will be totally prepared for a life of rebellion. They will not learn to properly fear anyone who will probably lose their jobs when a boss asks them to do something. Don't tell them that 99% of those in leadership positions are good people who are sincere and have never been indicted for anything. Leave them with the impression that they're all bad. Don't ever say, I love you. They can figure that out. After all, you've given them everything they've ever wanted. What more can a parent do, of course? Don't give them yourself. So, it's an edge to this, isn't there? Give them everything they want by buy something for them every time. If you go into a store, never say no to them. When properly trained this way, they will be used to having every appetite of theirs fulfilled immediately. When they grow older and develop natural sexual appetites, they will have been trained by you to seek immediate fulfillment. Teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases shouldn't really surprise the parent then. So give them everything they ask for while they're kids. Never teach them the Bible. Teach them math, science, history, art, music, reading, physical education, sex education, etc. But don't teach them the Bible. Let them decide for themselves. Make them go to school five days a week for all day. But don't take them to church for an hour on Sunday. Always trust your child. He's a little angel. He wouldn't dare do anything behind your back. Did you ever ask a young person whom you catch smoking? I mean, this is from the 70s, okay? I mean, smoking might be a, a good step up today. I don't know. Uh, do you smoke at home? Usually the answer is, you've got to be kidding. My parents would kill me. Remember, that's the other kids in town. Yours would never do that. <laughs> I remember in 1956, the normal one concern in a classroom was sticking a wad of gum underneath the desk. I don't know that that's on the list today. Scream at your children. This is the only type of communication necessary to raise a brat. Time spent answering their questions and instructing them is wasted time. The only training really required for parents is potty training. After that, it's the obligation of daycares, preschools, and schools. Scream constantly, and the fond memories your children have of the home life will assure you as a parent that your kids will never take care of you when you're old. <laughs> Let your child come and go as they will. Don't set any boundaries. This will lead to a life of insecurity. Brats don't need guidelines. Make sure they're popular. They must be with the in-crowd. Their peers don't let them be an oddball. If they follow the crowd, the crowd will become the greatest influence in their lives. Nothing to fear there, right? Let them watch TV constantly. Keep them away from reality. Let them live in a fantasy all their lives. Brats in the entertainment. Life of comfort and ease produces high-class brats. They won't know how to deal with reality or real people, but maybe they'll just go to the 
into seclusion rather than become contentious or hostile. It's usually one or the other. Conclusion, brats are produced, not born. Actually, brats are born, um, but you can enhance and amplify the brat perspective uh, apart from training. It takes effort to obey the principles parents should prepare themselves for a life of heartbreak, for it is sure to come. And so this was uh, put together by uh, secular people um, years and years ago, but you certainly can see, uh, though it's sarcastically presented, the reality of what they're trying to say. Um, and you don't have to be a believer in Christ to feel the immense burden and responsibility that comes upon you when a child arrives into your life. Uh, as new parents, your world suddenly has expanded dramatically. All of a sudden, there's a new human being that is 100% dependent on you uh, for its survival, its growth, its ability to function productively and walk safely through the coming years. And so it's, it's scary in ways. And yet, the Bible addresses uh, children and parents, here especially in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, you can pick it up in verse 1. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long, uh, live long on the earth. And you fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And we're going to look at really just the first part of, of Ephesians, uh, chapter six, or Ephesians 6 and verse 4 this morning. But you know, if you're going to be the parent God wants you to be, you need all the resources of God's grace, and that includes the Holy Spirit. And if you don't belong to God, uh, you're not able to understand the specific divine revelation uh, that he gives here, nor are you equipped to allow God to work in you and through you to carry it out. And so the Spirit of God needs to be in your life, and that only comes through salvation. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. And so a mark of ownership relative to God in you is do you possess the Spirit of God? That is his, his mark of ownership upon you. If we compare Scripture with Scripture, we see that First John, in the epistle of 1 John, John said this, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has this witness in himself. He who does not believe God, notice, has made God a liar, because not, he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is not in church. It's not in baptism or ritual or anything else. It's in his Son. And so the issue is, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son doesn't have life. And so the issue of having life, eternal life, is tied to the possession of the Son. And so in order for you to have eternal life or possess the Spirit of God, you need to understand the gospel because Ephesians 1 says this, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And so you need to hear a message. The message is called the gospel of your salvation, which is centered in the person of Christ and his work for us. And when you believe, at that moment, that's an aorist participle, you are at that point sealed permanently and forever with the Holy Spirit of promise, and he becomes the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. And so the gospel of your salvation is the key, and the word gospel means good news, and the good news of the gospel is that God in love, through the person of Christ, paid your sin penalty through his death. That's the good news of the gospel. John 3.16 summarizes it in a way, for God still loved the world. This is a demonstration of God's love. He gave his only begotten son, who was God who became a man, and unlike you and me, never sinned. And whoever believes in him won't perish but have eternal life. And so you need to understand why that's an important message. You need to understand the cross is the ultimate demonstration of God's love. Bible was clear, God loves you. How did he demonstrate that? It's one thing to say, I love you. He demonstrated it. In fact, his own love toward us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why is that the demonstration of God's love? I'm going to find that. Oh, boy. Uh, 
missing my eraser. See, on that cross, Christ died for all sins, for all people, for all time. And the word for there carries the idea of in the place of. You and I are sinners before God. We're separated from God. And there's nothing we can do to remove that separation. All the good works in the world wouldn't change the reality that you're a sinner. They can't make you holy before God. They don't remove your sin in any way. Because the wages of sin is death. And so death needs to be applied in order for you to be reconciled to God and have your sins removed. But if you dying for your own sins means you pay the penalty, and which means you need to spend eternity separated from God on the lake of fire. That's the bad news of the gospel. But Christ on the cross took all your sins upon him. In fact, he did this <coughs> in advance 2,000 years ago. He paid for your sins, the ones you've done, the ones you've yet to do, and he paid for them in full. He cried under the cross, it is finished. That means paid in full. And so the bill's been paid. There's nothing left to do. And to prove that God accepted his payment, Christ rose from the grave. And he lives forevermore. And the same life he possesses, he gives freely to any and all that are willing to accept it. And so you can receive eternal life and the Holy Spirit, which you need to be the parent God would have you to be, and be saved from the horrors of hell on one condition. If you're willing to put 100% of your trust in Christ in Jesus Christ and his death for your sins. He's called the Savior. Savior, by definition, saves. He saves any and all that are willing to humble themselves and say, I can't do it on my own. I need a Savior. My baptism doesn't help me. Anything I can think of doesn't help me. Because those are things that are, at best, filthy rags to God, nor can they remove sin, because Christ, John the Baptist looked at the Lord Jesus Christ and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's it. That's why salvation is by grace. Grace means you get something you don't deserve. You can't earn it. You can't be worthy of it. It's free to any and all. The issue is, will you humble yourself and take it? And I don't know why on God's green earth you wouldn't. This is your only hope for life after death. This is it. There's, it's silly to roll, your, roll the dice on something that you think might get you there when, in fact, the Bible says it can't. And since Jesus Christ can't lie, why wouldn't you go with him who demonstrated his love for you instead of trusting something else or hoping that maybe the whole thing's a joke? That's a long miss. And so the moment you get saved, however, again, the Spirit of God takes up residence within you. He can then empower you. He can then equip you and illuminate your thinking so you can learn the Word of God. And Christ said, you should know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And when it comes to parenting, that is an amazing, th uh, amazing thing. Uh, he works in you to that end. It's all by the grace of God. You need to be willing to have your thinking transformed as you take in the word of God so he can change you and have the person and parent he'd have you to be. Otherwise, it'll never happen. And so we need to renew our minds in the scriptures here, and thankfully we have the privilege of doing that. And so where does one acquire the skill and wisdom to be the parent God would have them to be? It's from the scriptures. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. For what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction. And this has to do with your thinking so you can be instructed in righteousness so that you can be complete, that means brought to maturity, and thoroughly equipped for every good work God would have you to do, including the daunting task of parenting. And so, thankfully, we have the Bible. And when Paul here is addressing uh, children and parents, six, uh, in chapter 6 here, he's addressing children who, by definition, are under their parents' care. I should say that they're still dependent on their parents. They haven't left the home. They're not on their own. And so they're under their protection and authority. And the Bible says that children can understand the Bible because God is giving some instruction to children here. And so he expects these, the children to be capable of understanding this, capable of learning truths from God's word. And he gives a command here to children. Children to obey their parents in the Lord for this is right. Now ideally, to do this in a way that honors God, they need to be filled with the Spirit, as this happens after Ephesians 5.18, which commands us to be filled with the Spirit. But regardless, a children is to obey their parent. This is what God has designed. They want to, God wants them to obey them. He wants to honor them. It pleases both the parents and it pleases God. 
as they're empowered by the Spirit of God to see it done. Now, this is a present active imperative. The child is responsible that, to do that and the power that God provides because God's given delegated authority over the children and that delegated authority is their parents. And so the, God expects children to obey their parents. Oftentimes, parents don't obey their children to expect, however, their parents to obey them. And that leads to all kinds of trouble. And you might be thinking, what are we talking about when we're talking obey here? Obey, it's a Greek word, hupokuo, it literally means to listen under with the attentiveness to respond positively to what is heard. And so your children have to listen, then assimilate into their thinking what is said, and then put it into practice. The sense is that one understands and responds accordingly. It implies an inward attitude of respect and honor as well as an external act of obedience. It's a present imperative. It's a command. This is the way it's to be normally, all the time. And so, in the present verse, this means spirit-filled children are to continually put themselves under the words and authority of their parents. They're to continually exhibit a readiness to hearken, give respectful attention, give heed to, to the parents' commands and instructions. So children must obey their parents as an act of obedience to the Lord. That's the idea. In fact, in training your children, I highly recommend parents, when they do that, to appeal to a higher authority, to the Lord, I repeatedly asked my children as they were in my house, so what would the Lord have here? What is God's will in this matter? Because the issue ultimately isn't what I have to say, it's ultimately what does God want? And so that's an important thing to do. And you might think, well, you know, how far should we take this thing? Well, Colossians 3.20 says, children obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing to the Lord. For those that are looking for a back door and a, and a butt and an escape clause, all things. All things? What do you mean all things? Well, we're assuming that it's legal and ethical and biblical. I mean, if your dad says go burn down the neighbor's garage, you got the right to say, Dad, that's not what God would have me to do. And so, you know, but the parents have a, a, a right and authority to dictate what their children can do in all areas of life. And this is so important in our day and age. Probably more so than when I was growing up. You know, when I was growing up, there was three channels on TV. And you had to have rabbit ears to even get them to come in. And they fought, they were still they were black and white when I started. You know, and you could ride your bike anywhere. There was no such thing as an internet. There were no such things as mobile phones. There was no such thing as Netflix. I mean, the world has changed so dramatically, and the potential for exposure to that which is contrary to what God des desires is, is hard to even wrap your brain around. In fact, what I've come to see here, even though I'm a kind of an old goat, is that social media is one of the most destructive things in the world today. It's destroying lives left and right. And the parents sometimes are absolutely oblivious to what is going on in social media and what their children are being exposed to. And if you're a parent, let me just strongly recommend that you watch that like a hawk. You know, my children didn't have a phone until they were in college. We had to force Lisa to get one because we were sending her to a college and she's just a child. And I said, you need to stay in touch with us. It's just crazy. But you decide what they eat, what they wear, when they go to bed. Now this doesn't mean you're the, one of these helicopter parents. You know, you can take this too far. I mean, some, it sounds so controlling. And who here likes to be told what to do? I just see no hands. Uh, and so that's part of the problem. No one likes to be told. You like to be told what to do, Nicholas? Yeah. I'm not really shocked at your answer. Yeah. But you know what? God says, this is my plan. This is for your good. And when you have the right mindset, you say, you know what? This is what God designed. And I only get in trouble when I think I have a better idea than God. And if you think you have a better idea than God, you're asking. You'd be further ahead. You go beat yourself in the ground with a baseball bat out there. God's not going to be mocked. 
You mess with the bull, you get the horns. That's just how it is. And so parents are responsible to oversee everything that takes place in their children's lives. And children are to what? Honor their parents. Verse 2, this is another command. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment of the promise. In case you're wondering, it tells you it's a commandment, that it may be well with you. You may live long on the earth. And so children are to honor their parents because God promises to bless them if they do. Right? God will show you favorites to your advantage to obey your parents. And so children have been given the directive by God to obey parents in all things. And so children, are you listening? Is there anyone here that wants to argue with me and debate about that? I ain't got time, so. No. But you know, how often do I see, and it pains me, to watch children get, or excuse me, parents get into a debate with their child and to convince them that they should do something. You know, my dad was really old school. When he said jump, you said how high. And yet ultimately he wasn't wrong because I was to obey him. But, you know, it wasn't ever open for debate. Now, as we got older, we were, he was wise enough that we talked about things. And, and as a wise parent, you talk and explain why you're doing what you're doing so that you're teaching and training and, and there's understanding involved. But you're the authority. And parent, children are to obey. And so this, these, these debates that go on drive me crazy. I mean, I don't even debate with my granddaughter. She's two and a half. She wants to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me. She don't win. But she loves me anyway. It's great. You know, control is really never an end in itself. It's a means to an end. Because ultimately, it's a heart issue. See, and God wants the child to think in terms of pleasing the Lord and pleasing their parents. And it's been shown time and time again that the child is happiness when it's pleasing its parents. And yet Satan's whispering in their ear, no, be your own person. And yet you want to be happy, please your parents. I was the happiest as a child when I pleased my parents. I still remember it. There was peace in my soul. There was harmony in the home. It was wonderful. But you need to address the heart Proverbs 4.23 tells us, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Ultimately, it's a heart. In fact, NIV says, above all else, guard the heart, for it's the wellspring of life. New American Standard says, watch over your heart with all diligence, from it flow the springs of life. See, ultimately what takes place in the heart wiggles its way to the top and it comes out externally, and, and Jesus referenced this, from within out of the heart of men proceed what? Evil thoughts. That's where it all starts and then it leads to fornications and thefts and murders and adulteries and coveting and wickedness and deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride and foolishness. <gasps> That's a long list. All these evil things proceed from within and defile a man. It's a heart issue. Jesus also said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. That is a fixed principle. And so behavior really isn't the ultimate bottom line issue. The issue is what's going on in the heart, and you have to address the behavior, but you need to couple it with instruction and correction on a heart level so they learn to respond to the Lord and you're just an intermediary, so to speak, that God has placed. You know, it's easy to get sidetracked and make the behavior the issue. And obviously you want to see a behavior change, but you want to address the heart like that one guy said, that one kid said, he says, I'm obeying on the outside, but I'm not on the inside, said that to his dad. That's, got, that's what we call in my, the word we use in high school was attitude problem. We got attitude problems here. I had a sixth grade teacher that said I had an attitude problem <laughs> as he lifted me off the ground by the hairs on the back of my neck. Lachlan, you got an attitude problem. Oh yeah? <laughs> you know, and this is why I'd have to have my heart right with the Lord. So important. 
I need to be responding to him for the wisdom I need. You know, your child knows what's real to you and what isn't. I mean, if you tell your child, well, I want you to be considerate of someone, but you're never considerate of someone, there's kind of a disconnect there, right? That's classic, do as I say, not as I do. If you're not honest with your dealings with others, your children will know that, and they're going to follow your lead. And then when you spiritualize it on top of it, you make a mockery of God. And the damages can be long-term, horrible. They're either going to see through it and see that Christianity in their mind is a joke, or they're going to think that this is how the game is. I still remember, as an unsaved person at 19 years old, my dad, who was very, very principled, I always thought he made principled decisions 100% of the time, when he came to a crossroads where if this principled decision was made, it would cost him a boatload of money. And he said, we're not doing that. And I remember in my mind thinking, so that's how this game is played. The principle is only good if it benefits me personally at that moment in time. Otherwise, forget it. And I took a left turn and almost wrecked my life but thankfully, I got saved. But I still remember that turning point in my mind. Oh, this is how this works. Still remember it. You know, we want to teach your children that this is all about the Lord. It's about His honor. And that's the way we don't screw up. The issue is, do I own my screw-ups? We all screw up. Mercy. But you know, if you never sacrifice for the greater good in the will of God, your children won't. If you whine and complain about everything, your children will whine and complain. If you don't handle injustice in a God-honoring way, they're not going to handle injustice in a God-honoring way. If you're demanding your rights, don't expect your children to rise above you. If you never sacrifice for anyone else, why would your children ever sacrifice for anyone else? Right? I mean, your bottom line rises to the top just like their bottom line rises to the top. If my bottom line is popularity, am I going to take a stand for Christ? Nah. If it's money, am I going to compromise biblical principle for a buck? Absolutely. And that's ultimately what you convey to your children is what's in your heart. By the decisions you make, by the priorities you have. And eventually they'll figure out the difference between what's real and what isn't real. This is just a hollow routine we go through. We do this because, you know what, it's the right thing to do. But it means nothing to us, thank you. That's a possibility. And again, they know your priorities because it is a fixed principle in life that you always make time for what you think is important. That's always how it works. And so your priorities will be well understood. And I've said it years ago. I can tell your priorities, you show me your calendar and your checkbook, and I'll tell you exactly what's important to you. Because you always make time for what's important. And if you have no vision for the lost, if you think, ah, let them go to hell, well, that's the attitude they're going to have. And so this is why we need to allow the Word of God to trans uh, transform our own thinking so that what the Lord Jesus Christ loves and what's important to Him becomes important to me. That affects the decisions I make. And through that process, I'm training my children to think the same way. And you need to take the time to do that. This nonsense. I'll let the kid decide for himself. That, that's so bonkers. I mean, that's like putting a toothbrush on the sink and a toothpaste nearby and said, well, maybe the kid will figure it out. I'll let him decide for himself if he wants to brush his teeth. And after his breath could stop a train and his teeth rot in five years. Dad, why didn't you tell me to brush my teeth? Ah, oh, I thought you'd figure it out on your own, kid. Right? No, you explain to him the necessity and importance of these things. It's all part of the training process. And that's in every realm of life. And so you teach him how to pray. You teach him how to think biblically and principally. Because this is your privilege and responsibility as a parent. Do you teach your children to have respect for God and His Word? I distinctly remember, this is many, many years ago, having a conversation with a parent who specifically told me they didn't want their child to be a weirdo. Take a stand for Christ. Well, guess where that kid is today? His life's a mess. He's in his 40s now. 
because life's an absolute mess. Instead of teaching them, you know what, this is what, either this is right or it's wrong. If this is right, let's do it. It's on to the Lord. If it isn't, who cares? I mean, you look at society today. Families are just unraveling everywhere. Well, as we think of verse 4 here, it says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. First, Paul gives a negative command, and then the positive one. Tells us not what not to do, and then what to do. And we're going to focus on the negative. Bummer. Fathers, parents, do not provoke their children to anger. Now, it says here, fathers... And it can't be overlooked that the responsibility of nurturing children in the faith is fixed squarely on your shoulders as a father. You're the head of the household. You're the head of the family, and so you're going to give an account like I am. Mothers obviously have much to do with the nurture and training of children, but that, in fact, their, their role oftentimes is more important. But the Greek word for fathers is the Greek word pateros, and it's usually, although usually the word for the male head of the family, it's sometimes used to speak of parents both mother and father, this is how it's used in Hebrews 11.23. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents. That's the same word. It wasn't just his father, it was his parents. In fact, the godly mother, Jochebed, made a huge difference in Moses' life because when he became of age, he acted just like his mom did and said no to the Egyptians. It says, they saw, they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. She, told, she taught, and obviously the father was part of that, not to be afraid of the king's command, but to do the right thing. And so when he's 40 years old, he says, you know what, I'm going to do the right thing. Just like my mom taught me, just like my dad taught me. It's amazing, isn't it? Now this negative command is the word provoke. And so provoke... It's a Greek word that means to make angry, to cause to be irritated or exasperate. It means to stimulate one to the point of brooding, simmering anger that is nurtured and not allowed to die. Now listen. It is seen in the holding of a grudge and the smoldering bitterness that refuses to forgive in the anger that cherishes resentment and does not want reconciliation. And so it's possible for that to be the result in a child through the actions of a father. It's a present imperative, but the negative means stop provoking your children to anger. That Colossians 3.21, which is a parallel epistle, says it this way, Fathers, don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And so not provoking your children involves avoiding attitudes and words and actions and which would drive a child to be angry, exasperation, to anger should be exasperating or resentment and thus rules out excessively severe discipline, unreasonably harsh demands, abuse of authority, arbitrariness, unfairness, constant nagging and condemnation, subjecting a child to humiliation and all forms of gross insensitivity to a child's needs and sensibilities. I know that's a mouthful. I want to read you a story that I found on the website Bible.org. This guy wrote this about himself. He says, I was just 12 when my Boy Scout troop planned a father-son camp out. I was thrilled. I could hardly wait to rush home and give my father all the information. I wanted so much to show him that all that I'd learned in scouting, and I was proud, so proud when he said he'd go with me. On the Friday, the camp out finally came. I had all my gear out in the porch and, and ready to stuff in the car the moment he arrived. We were to meet the local school at 5 p.m. to carpool to the campground. My dad didn't get home from work till 7 I was frantic, but he explained how things had gone wrong at work and told me not to worry. We still get up first thing in the morning and join the others. After all, we had a map. I was disappointed, of course, but decided just to make the best of it. First thing in the morning, I was up, had everything in the car while it was just barely getting light, all ready for us to catch up with my friends and their fathers at the campground. He said we'd leave around 7 a.m. I was ready a half hour before that. He never came out of his room until 9. When he saw me standing out of the front of the camping gear, he finally explained that he had a bad back and couldn't sleep on the ground. He hoped I'd understood and I'd be a big boy about it, but I could please, and I could please get his things out of his car because he had several commitments he had to keep. Just about the hardest thing I've ever done was to go to the car and take out my sleeping bag, cooking stove, tents, and supplies. And while I was putting my stuff away, 
in the storage shed, I thought, he, he thought that I couldn't see him. I watched my father carry his golf clubs out and throw them in his trunk and drive away to keep his commitment. That's when I realized my dad never meant to go with me to the camp out. It didn't matter to him, but his golfing buddies did. Now that's painful to read. See, to exasperate means to stir up, to frustrate, to vex, to annoy, to make angry. Now, again, this isn't about your children being upset because you told them to obey and having a hissy fit like that. This is about long-term issues. And so I'm going to give you some, a list here of things that can exasperate children. And we can take note. Children become exasperated when parents don't provide discipline. You know, according to Hebrews 12, 6, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And since he loves you and me, he disciplines us. That's how he shows his love. It's a vital part of raising children. Proverbs 19, 18 says, Discipline your son while there is hope, and do not desire his death. You know, children who are consistently and fairly disciplined grow up secure in their parents' love. Those who are left or unwild often believe their parents don't really love them or care about them. Now, we're, not ta we're talking about discipline, loving discipline, not abuse. God never abuses us. We're talking about fair and reasonable and consistent and loving and sometimes unpleasant correction. And when it's done right, it prevents exasperation. Children become exasperated when discipline is inconsistent. You know, thankfully, our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always consistent in his discipline. You know, sometimes parents, one time, you know, something happens and it's treated like a capital crime. And the next time, the very same issue is overlooked and treated lightly. And there's confusion then in the mind of the child. And this usually happens because parents oftentimes discipline according to their mood swings. They're in a bad mood, you, oh boy, right? Here we go. They're in a good mood, ah, we'll let that go, right? I mean, one minute they're breathing fire and the wrath of God's coming down, the next minute it's the opposite. And so the child never knows to what to expect. And so he finally gives up trying to figure this thing out and he learns to manipulate his parents. And so God wants you to be principled in your discipline, do it in a way that is consistent with biblical values, done in love with the goal of a changed heart. And that's how this thing has worked. This is what God does with us. He disciplines us so we'd have a change of heart, change of attitude. Children become exasperated when love is withheld as a means of discipline. You know, love should never be the reward of good behavior. Love needs to be constant. You love your child when he or she does well, and you love them when they do wrong, and this is so critical. I mean, Jesus is not out there saying, you know, well, I love you, oh, you know. You don't have to pick out a daisy and think, he loves me, he loves me not, you know. He loves you regardless. He loved you when you were doing wrong. He loved you when you were at your worst and sent Christ to die for you. And as your child, he, he can't love you anymore. As his child, he can't love you anymore than he already does. You know, we sing a Bible school song. Jesus loves me when I'm good and I do the things I should. Jesus loves me when I'm bad, though it makes him very sad. And so you don't want to communicate love based on performance. Love is to be there. And you need to love them even in the discipline and explain that in discipline, this is how you're showing your love and you do it lovingly. And you need the Spirit of God to do it. This is why I still tell my children all the time that I love them and I'm never going to stop. And it's not awkward or anything. I mean, what a privilege it is to love children. Man, and now I get to love grandchildren. It's unbelievable. In fact, embarrass your teenager today. Tell them you love them in front of a bunch of people. 
<laughs> Children can become exasperated when their parents' discipline is hypocritical. That's the classic do as I say, not as I do. Never work for anybody. If you were told that, you know it didn't work for you, so why should it work now, right? They could become confused and disillusioned. If they're punished for being disrespectful to others, but they see their parents berating each other and speaking evil to the next door neighbor and their employer, the hypocrisy leads to exasperation. Children become exasperated when there's a lack of instruction. You know, we have instruction for the Word of God. He explains to us how we are to think and what we are to do by His grace. And that's your privilege to do with your children. You want to do the very same thing. I mean, a child is expected to do something, but he doesn't know how to do it. He hasn't been trained, and yet he's held accountable for it. That equals exasperation. One of my first bosses I had was like that. Expecting me to know what to do, I never knew what to do. And so I was just waiting all the time. Well, I'm going to get yelled at because I have no idea what I'm doing. And that's the kind of boss he was. And it was good for me. I was... I learned maturity that, that, that summer in ways that I needed to, even though I wanted to let, my flesh wanted to let the air out of his tires. <coughs> but that's just what I needed to learn. But I was exasperated. And the same thing can happen. And children can be exasperated by impatient instruction, right? I mean, God is patient with us, mercy. He was patient before you got saved. He's patient after you got saved. And that's how he wants us to be with our children. You know, you're training a child and it takes them a long time to do something you can do in two minutes. What's the temptation? I'll take care of this, right? Now there's a process to it and there's a value in teaching it. It might be harder on you than it is on them, but it's worth it, right? always takes longer to teach something than to do it yourself. Now, that doesn't mean if they're dawdling around, you know. I mean, invariably, our kids went through a stage where you say, it's time to pick things up. What did they start doing? Playing with it, or whatever it was they did. They stalled. I forgot years ago, I was at someone's house, and the child was supposed to brush their teeth, and I'm thinking, this is a class A exhibit of how to stall. This was classic stalling. It drove me crazy. <laughs> oh. And so that's, you know, that's not what we're talking about, right? But some kids learn how to dawdle so they get out of doing stuff because that's what you've trained them to do, right? Am I bringing back fond memories? This morning, with anybody else. <laughs> Children become exasperated when there's overprotection. You never allow them any liberty. You get strict rules about everything. These parents don't trust their kids. They don't give their kids a chance. Kid becomes exasperated. You know, you need to communicate your children that you trust them. And like any relationships, trust is developed, but opportunities must be utilized in the training process. You know, God protects us at times, and thankfully he does, or we'd all be dead, but he also allows us to make mistakes so we learn from them, right? And that's part of the training process as well. Some go too far in this area. They don't allow their kids to fail at anything and they become these helicopter parents. I still remember cringing letting my son drive, because that's a lesson that you don't want to learn the hard way, because he drives fast, and to this day, he drives way too fast. <laughs> I told him once, listen, you have a family now. Will you please slow down? <laughs> God, please protect my son. <laughs> uh. I was told here recently he still drives fast. Not that I have any flaws. I'm sweating. Wow. 
You know, children can become exasperated when their parents show favoritism, often unwittingly. And, you know, the worst thing you do is compare children with children, you know, in terms of their achievements, abilities, or grades. I mean, they're all unique. They all got strengths and weaknesses. God only makes originals. He doesn't make copies. And you need the wisdom to figure that out. I mean, the worst thing anyone can ever say to someone, why can't you be like Joey over there? Because Joey's Joey and Jimmy's Jimmy. Not that doesn't mean you don't address things, but that's just the wrong approach, right? Children become exasperated when depreciating their worth. You know, children, especially in this day and age, are convinced they're just not that important. And one of the reasons that's, it happens is because parents don't listen to their children. They don't have time for them. They don't let them be frustrated. They don't talk things out. The child doesn't feel comfortable being honest with their parent. Now, they should obviously be polite and respectful. But boy, you want your child to come to you because they know that you love them and they trust them and you, and you want to work through th things with them. And that they have value. And they give up. And you see, especially teenagers have an innate desire to belong to something. And if they've got a secure home in which they can belong to, they won't look for that security outside the home. And one of the reasons things are such a mess today is because there's no security in the home and they, they find it in their peers. And when they find it in their peers, they're only going to rise to the level of what their peers are. And if they're with the wrong peers, it's going to be a disaster. Children become exasperated when their parents are overtly critical and fault-finding. You know, a child learns what he lives. If he lives with criticism, doesn't learn responsibility. He learns to condemn himself and find fault with others. I mean, some parents would never say anything positive to their children. I'm just working with my grandchildren this week, telling Ruthie she did such a good job with this. She did such a good job with that. Thanks for helping Grandpa. What can we do here to help Mom? You know, and hey, some kids never hear, job well done. All they hear is, well, you screwed up again. What do you know? And they fault find. And so the kid grows up with this impending doom. All right, here it comes. It doesn't help them at all. So they get exasperated. Children can become exasperated when their parents fail to keep promises. We talked a little bit about that, right? And Jill and I are learning that our one granddaughter's got a mind like a steel trap. If you said it six weeks later, you said this. Two and a half years old, I go, stop it already. Wow, it's like, no, I mean, I, it's just amazing what she can hear. It's kind of like you whisper ice cream from six blocks away, they figure that out, and, well, you know what I'm saying. Children can become exasperated when their parents never admit they're wrong. You know, there's, there were several times my family and I were doing something and dad didn't handle things well and dad would just come on, you know what, dad did not handle this well. They all knew I didn't handle it well, so who am I trying to kid? I said, this is what dad should have done, this is what dad failed to do, this is why dad confesses his sins to God, this is why you need to do that too. But if you never admit you're wrong, it's already over. Children become exasperated when their parents are unreasonable. You know, as children get older, you need to be flexible. You need to do a lot more explaining and training so they understand how to think biblically and principally. Can you be flexible? Can you be reasoned with? I mean, if a child feels something that's unfair, 
can you help them reason through how they should look at it? You know, they might have, think something's totally unfair when it's not. And then maybe it is, and maybe you need to reconsider something. Well, maybe you got a point there. Right? My dad was more of a my way or the highway kind of guy. That did not bode well, ultimately. But eventually we learned to talk, and I was grateful for that. Children can become exasperated when their parents embarrass them. Now, it's okay to embarrass them by telling them you love them, okay? That's okay. That's, that's good for them. But, you know, to make a scene and to embarrass them in a way that's inappropriate is very destructive. They can lead to exasperation. You don't want to embarrass them. Children can become exasperated when their parents overindulge them. You know, and I'm... You're asking your two-year-old, would you like yogurt, or what would you like? I mean, and then uh, it can just, and they give them everything they want. And moms do all their work for their kids so the kids don't learn any personal responsibility. That's overindulging. You know, I remember a parent asking their kid, well, would you like to do this today? The kid said no, and pretty soon they're not required to do anything. And in our house, kids, this is what we're going to do today. Made life a whole lot easier. Right? Again, as they're mature and as they can handle things, you can talk these things out. But when they're two years old, you know, you don't ask them what they want. You tell them what they're going to get. Children become exasperated and their parents inadvertently communicate to them that they're unwanted. I remember hearing a mother say here, not, oh, it's probably a few years ago, but in front of her kids, she couldn't wait to get back to work, get rid of her kids. I just, that was hard, hard for me to hear. Oh, kid learns well, I guess I'm not that wanted, right? Children can be exasperated when their parents are verbally abusive. Because we all know words are powerful. Words can either embolden or they can strengthen or they can tear down and cut. I'm out of time. Children can become exasperated when their parents are weak on authority. You know, parents can train their kids, teach them what it takes to wear them down. So the parent just, or the kid just wears that parent down because the, their word doesn't mean anything. And so the kid knows if I push hard enough, I'll get them to do what I want. And they learn to be outstanding manipulators. And then when they get into the real world and this doesn't work so well, they have all kinds of problems. As you can see through the study, if you're going to be a godly father, it takes every ounce of grace there is. We're the weak link in the chain. Without Christ, we can't do anything. And yet we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so this is a daunting responsibility, but God said his grace is sufficient. And thankfully, you have the word of God, and we have prayer, and we can honor the wisdom we need to bring up our children in the nurture and admiration of the Lord. So fathers... Pray and rest in who Christ is and what he can do in you and through you because we need him every second. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this lesson. We know it's humbling in so many ways. It's challenging in so many ways. And I'm thankful for fathers and I pray for the fathers. They need you. They need the wisdom that the word brings. We need the, they need to understand biblical principles. I pray that they be transformed by the renewing of their mind they can even prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Thank you that you are so merciful with us, and we pray that that mercy would help each father and grandfather here and father to be all that you'd have them to be for your glory. And we thank you because it's of Jesus Christ this could all happen. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
For our last song, if you can turn in your hymnals to number 398. 398. 